I gotta say, I have never been more proud of one of my creations to date. And it only took me about three months to create. Not too bad, right? If you haven't already, be sure to check out my flower dance played in five different styles video. That is the main subject of this video, so without seeing it first, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And while you're there, it'd be awesome if you guys subscribe to my new piano channel. It's much appreciated. Okay, now that we're on the same page, let's talk all about how I created my second ever arrangement and my first ever cinematic-ish piano video. To give you guys some context, I've always wanted to create a piano arrangement of something because I played piano for over a decade and want to continue and improve. At some point, I was learning from Kyle Landry, and he said that Flower Dance would be a great song to arrange by simplifying it. So I decided to start the project officially around February, and in this project, I went through seven trials. If you've watched my other project how-to videos, you'll know that I usually outline the steps, but since I basically struggled throughout the entire process, I find it more fitting to call them trials. So here we go. Every trial I faced in chronological sequence. Trial 1. Picking the piece. Trial 2. Creating the simplified arrangement. Trial 3. Coming up with the five styles idea and picking the five genres. Trial 4. Arranging the piece for the five styles. Trial 5. Practicing my arrangement. Trial 6. Filming in five different locations. And finally, trial 7. Editing the entire thing. And usually I would add a extra step saying, please subscribe, but I've already sort of done that for my piano channel. So I'll go ahead and save that for the next project. All right, that's every trial I went through. From here, we'll go into the details of each trial, but along the way, I'll give you my best tips on how I would approach it if I were to do it again. Trial one. So I basically explained already how I ended up choosing Flower Dance, but I should tell you guys that I've been a fan of the song since forever. I learned how to play a while back, getting the sheets from Rainbow Pig's channel. She was the first person I ever heard cover Flower Dance on piano, and I thought it was a great video. So in some ways, I was inspired by her and nudged by Kyle Landry to do this arrangement. My best advice for this trial is if you're trying something like this and trying to choose a piece, try to choose something that really resonates with you and has meaning. Trial 2. Creating my first piano arrangement. This was definitely an interesting process for sure. So interesting that I created a whole separate video just to get into the details of the process. The basic gist of it was that I tested out different programs to score my arrangement, found out a fast way to score with the program I ended up choosing. I then analyzed the piece and chord progressions throughout, and finally talked about how I simplified and broke down the original to create the score of my first piano arrangement. If any of that interests you, I'll leave a link below to check out that video. Which leads us to trial three. I thought it would be cool to play the piece in five distinct genres. I call them styles in my titles mainly because it sounds cooler. Genres would be the proper term. This five styles idea came out of nowhere as I was working on the arrangement, and oh was I a bit anxious thinking about the extra amount of work I had to do. But in the end, I am super glad that I did it. The first trial was deciding the five genres. My original choices were Nocturne, Ballade, Baroque, Jazz, and Waltz. I happened to be practicing Chopin's Nocturne in C minor, and another recent piece I practiced last year was his Ballade in G minor, so I felt like those two piano genres were at the top of my head. What I ended up choosing was Nocturne, Waltz, March, Jazz, and EDM. I took out Baroque because I thought of trying an EDM-esque feel for one of the styles later on, and I felt like that would be a fun idea that would vibe with a more general audience. I also took out Balad because it just seemed a little too close to a Nocturne in some ways. So that was sort of my thought process in selecting the genres. Trial 4. I journeyed into a jungle with five very different areas. The first thing I had to do was map out where these five areas were in the piece. So I basically just added labels to my score indicating which parts were what genre. The way I did this was by trying to make each section be played in each genre once, since there are a lot of repeated parts in the song. In the end, not every style hit every section, but I am satisfied with what I did in the final video. Also, just a quick note on how to use finale text. Be sure to link your text with the measure so that it follows it 
while you're scoring because it's annoying to have to keep moving it to the right place. Okay, let's start with the Nocturne. If you guys don't know what a Nocturne is, it's basically just a short composition of a romantic or dreamy character suggestive of night, typically for piano. That's the Google definition. I prefer the general definition, which is basically just of the night. So I deem this particular arrangement the night of the flower. The process was taxing but rewarding. I think the taxing part comes from having to score the arrangement. So it goes like this. One, I have my simple arrangement as a baseline score to work with already in Finale since I built it. And then I'm sort of reading off of that one as a pseudo lead sheet. So what I'm doing is just improvising basically. I stuck to the rule of keeping with the same chord progressions throughout the piece. All I needed to do was transform the piece into a different feel that matched the genre. So that was step two. Basically, I would just keep improvising with that feel of that genre in my head, and whenever I played something that I just felt was right, I scored it. For the Nocturne, I looked at the other Chopin Nocturnes for inspiration for the left hand, and I ended up going with a simple 1-5 pattern going upwards. The next one I did was the waltz. For this one, I kept it pretty simple. I just made the key signature 3-4 instead of 4-4, four, four, and made the left hand follow the same pattern as most waltzes. So the bass note in the lower register, and then the chord in the higher register of the keyboard. And for the right hand, I basically just messed around with the rhythm and used the same melody so that it would fit in the new time signature. And I call it the flower waltz. Sort of like flower dance, flower waltz, if you get it. All right, the march was the one I finished next. For this one, I actually took an idea that I trashed from my first arrangement and used it in this arrangement. I'd say it's probably the easiest out of the three because I just played basically the simple arrangement, but with a different left hand that felt more bouncy and march-like. I call this one the flower march. Jazz and EDM were the hardest ones for sure because I took a completely different approach for most of it. The one that was similar was the first section of jazz. I didn't know much about jazz, so before I began, I looked up some tutorials on YouTube, listened to some jazz, and from there, I just went for it and improvised a lot until I got something I was happy with, and then scored it. For this one, it was actually super long. Each measure was like 30 minutes to an hour to create, primarily because I had to score it, and I just wasn't very efficient at scoring all the swing notes and 30 second notes and weird rests. By the way, you can actually get my score on my website, but yeah. It was a tough process for the first section. So tough that I straight up just said, hey, I'm gonna just improvise the second section in the spirit of jazz, right? It sounds good on paper, but really I was just trying to make an excuse not to have to score anymore. Kyle did mention that it's a tedious process that takes up a lot of time, and I definitely agree. And that's why for EDM, none of it was scored. I basically just improvised all of EDM. I'll mention more on this later. Trial five, practice time. So I had a small break in between the time I scored this arrangement and started practicing it. Not a good choice. By the time I came around to practicing it, I felt like I had to learn my own score. Basically, it felt like I was learning a new piece. So my advice if you're trying this, don't take a break between scoring and practicing. Luckily for my EDM improv, I played something I liked for the first section and just kept playing it over and over again in a similar way until it sort of solidified in my head as a score. I honestly feel like that would have been the better approach for everything basically. But since I already had scored it, at least you guys who are interested in playing my arrangement can use it. Or at least part of it since the improv parts are just not scored. I'd say it was pretty difficult practicing the jazz and EDM section 2 parts because both of those were improvised and I just couldn't come across anything I liked and nothing stuck. Didn't really matter because I was getting angsty about this project lasting too long, so I decided to just hit up my friend and start recording. We just did take one of EDM, kind of sucked, so we're gonna do a lot more takes until I get like a good one. Uh, I'm sort of wearing like the jacket that I'm supposed to wear for it. Um, so the setup is really easy or simple. It's just light, piano, other lights. So rim light, key light, and then my piano right there is with my laptop. I'm recording into Logic, and then got a couple extra lights just to spice up the image. And my friend here, Roger, is operating the gimbal. And there's another camera right here that's just like static, just in case. Lesson number one from trial six. 
don't start recording unless your playing is rock solid. I'd say the time it took us to record me playing each section was doubled because I kept messing up and getting bad takes. But before I jump too far ahead, let's take a few steps back. Before recording, I formed a plan. I wanted to try recording in five different distinct locations that helped with the vibe and mood of each genre. While I was practicing each part, the inspiration kind of just struck me and I couldn't let go of the idea afterwards, so I just had to try and make it happen. I also imagined myself wearing different clothing for each one to match the vibe and feel as well. Come day one of recording, the only location I solidified in my head was for EDM. It was my regular YouTube setup, which I thought was good enough and a great testing ground for how to do things for the other locations. The rest, I sort of just had to come up with on the spot. So I'd say lesson two is know where you're recording and what types of shots and angles you want because my goodness, did we film a lot of takes and that made the editing process a hell of a lot longer. Lugging an electric keyboard around my house along with the cameras, lights, chairs, and my expensive, fragile looking laptop was not the funnest part of the process. I'd say for day two and three, I learned it wasn't really a two man job either. So if you can get more people helping you out, that would be ideal. Days two and three were the days I recorded at a park. It's always good to have a backpack that carries a lot of stuff at once because uh, lugging a lot of things around back and forth, multiple trips, it's not a good idea. Anyways, going back to day one, I filmed EDM part one, both of the waltz sections, and then jazz part one. I do feel like that was actually a mistake because I had to film EDM part two and jazz parts two and three on day three. And I did it alone because I didn't want Roger to have to wait for me to come up with a good improvisation. So I just recorded myself trying different things for about 1 hour and 30 minutes for the jazz section and another hour and 30 minutes for the EDM section until I got an improv run that I liked. And that is what you see as the final result. Honestly, I very much liked the two improvs that I came up with and recorded on the spot. I feel like I might have been able to do that with all of them, like I said before with the EDM section 1. It definitely would have saved me a lot of time if I had the improv sections down um, to begin with before recording because I had to set up the piano stuff twice for those locations. So day two was filming for the Nocturne at night. Interestingly, that was a pretty fun recording session. I didn't know how nice it was to play piano outside at night with the wind blowing on your face. It just felt really good. And getting to play my own sort of variation of a Nocturne too, it was just a great combination. For all the Nocturne sections, it took us about two to three hours, which was definitely overly long for this one. I recorded the sections beforehand and tried my best to emulate those recordings. So it's completely different from how I did day one's recordings. So I basically recorded in a software instrument connected to my keyboard. But for this one, what I did was play three good takes of the three sections, exported it to my phone, and then had a Bluetooth earbud so that I could listen and try to play with the same exact timing. If you're slightly confused, let me demystify some of the magic of a music video. Basically, every time you see a cut and it moves to a scene where the previous scene's camera would have been seen, that's 100% a different take. To finish off, day three was filming the original introduction and the march. Word of caution, if you're filming in a public place, just be prepared to have people where you want to shoot. We filmed at an unfortunate time where people were planting stuff behind us, so we kind of had to wait. Patience is a virtue. So a few more tips for this section. One, it's really difficult to direct, move cameras and lights around, worry about labeling takes in logic, and play all at the same time. This is why experience is important, because you gain foresight to what you already need to have ready by the time you film, so you get to focus primarily on the performance. This also requires that you trust the people you're working with. In my case, my friend isn't a professional cinematographer, and in fact, it's his second time using my gimbal. This led to a lot of repeated angled shots on the first day, leaving me with a lot less to work with than I imagined in my head. Luckily, I set up some static shots that I could use where my vision was more or less clear because I set it up according to how I saw some parts in my head. Two, be ready for lots of storage to be taken up if you're not prepped. This project ended up taking 500 gigabytes of storage space because I recorded everything in 4K and had so many takes. Number three, charge your gear and take breaks because your gear may not be able to take super long recording sessions. 
What ended up happening for my last take of EDM, section two, which also happened to be the take I used, two of my cameras died, so I had no choice but to use the center one. I wanted to record the entire process for the sake of vlogging, but it probably would have been smarter to just have used a different vlogging camera like my phone and then turn on the other 4K cameras once the improv parts were ready. What I did was run my cameras for about three hours with little breaks and that ended up overheating it. Afterwards, I learned that you can actually set the tolerance to a higher level. You just have to make sure that it's on a tripod so you don't get low temperature burns. Would have been good to know beforehand, but you know, live and learn. By the way, all my equipment is listed in my kit link down below if you're interested. All right, guys, let's move on to the last trial. Trial seven, editing. All right, first things first, file management. It's tedious, but it will help keep things organized and keep the editing process smooth. So I rename things after importing them. I basically just use the mass rename function and change the beginning to the camera name plus the genre section. This way, no name would be the same. After that, I imported everything into Premiere Pro and started to sift through the footage to find good shots that I liked. My approach is actually one of many. I could have taken all the good takes in Logic first with good attached to their names and then stitched those together. I actually think that probably would have been the faster way to approach the edits instead of what I did. What I did was find the good footage and then match that footage with the audio take and then stitch together those MIDI files, which I didn't really want to do, but I figured it'd be the easiest for timing. However, there were parts where I did have to use footage that didn't match with the exact audio. The best way I found to make it match better is to do some time remapping, which just means slowing things down or speeding up the footage in subtle ways to make it look synced up. That's only acceptable if you were playing around the same tempo every single time, which I do think is a really good idea to have a metronome or tempo in mind, but some sections were rubato, so I couldn't exactly do that for those sections. Again, I think if I were to do this over, I'd stitch up all the good audio takes first, then try to align the footage with that because it's just two steps versus what I did, which is three steps, possibly more. By the way, for this step, it's super important that the playback preview is running smoothly and not choppy. My MacBook Pro can't handle 4K footage very well in Premiere, so I had to create proxies for it. You can do that by right-clicking your clips in the project manager and then click create proxies and it brings it into media encoder and from there to toggle the proxies after they're created you just need to add this icon to the row below the preview and click it this helped a lot i think the easiest time to create the proxies would be overnight i actually learned about proxies during this project and i'll be using them from now on to avoid slow playback by the way, anything you do to the proxy will be applied to the real clip and Premiere will automatically export with the original footage. All right, that was a bit of a tangent, but hopefully that tip helps you guys. I will say, even though I'm talking about the process of finding footage briefly, the majority of the time actually went into sifting through footage and choosing the right ones to use at the right times. Sometimes I had to compromise, for instance, this shot where you see my laptop and another shot where you see my laptop again. My friend said he swears that he didn't see it because his focus was on me, but I thought it was pretty obvious. However, it was still the best shot that we got, so I just went with it. Before we move on to the next editing section, I wanted to mention something briefly, which kind of hurt my soul. It was the complete cutting of my second jazz improv section. If you watched my video, you know that there's sort of this one big jazz section. There's actually supposed to be another one that happens after the second waltz section, but as I was editing and listening, I felt like it was dragging on for a little too long, and the jazz section felt like it served the same purpose as the waltz section two that came right before it. I spent a good 30 to 45 minutes coming up with that section, and I'm playing it right now in the background for you guys to hear. It was definitely a tough decision to cut it, but I just felt like it was musically right, and I just stuck with my gut. All right, so after cutting everything together in Premiere, I brought it into After Effects using Dynamic Link and did my keyframing in there. So for my static shots, I added motion by just keyframing scale and position mainly. I did have a lot of fun with the EDM part two and added some shaking to the camera. I thought it was pretty funny. At the same time I was doing this, I also added the text graphics and animations as well as any color correcting that was needed. And oh my gosh, was this clip super orange. Definitely should have gone for the manual setting in the white balance. Anyways, 
The other thing I worked on while going through chronologically was transitions. I already chose shots that looked similar in Premiere, so I just had to rotate or line things up and zoom in to make things look as close as possible. I actually didn't have any planned transitions between the different styles, but because we did so many takes, I managed to find shots that were similar and use them as transitions. That's one of the benefits of having so many takes. So yeah, this section was just a lot of keyframing and adding graphics. And real quick, here are some extra tips or summarized versions of what I've talked about so far. One, it's definitely important to say something like Waltz section one, take two, when you film. It just helps with figuring out which video take is connected to which audio take in Logic. Two, when I was alone, I found out that making a visual cue to the camera indicating that a take was a good one was very helpful in terms of finding the good takes very quickly. And lastly, it was helpful to have the audio from the camera to use in order to sync with the Logic audio as well. Speaking of Logic, here's a quick rundown of how I stitched the MIDI audio together, which happened before the After Effects section. So after having recorded everything and organizing them in stacks, and then reorganizing them in chronological order, I went in the stacks to find the good takes and put them all in one layer. Unfortunately, I'm making it sound easy, but it took a long, long time. Since combining the audio wasn't my first step, what I did was take all the editing I did in Premiere and I rendered it out with just audio. You can do this by just duplicating your sequence and then just cutting out all of the visuals. From there, I made it an MP3 file in Audition and then imported it into Logic. Then I synced up each individual MIDI clip to the draft audio so that the timing would remain the same. And I mean exactly the same. You can zoom in quite a lot in Logic. This process seriously took a long time because the MIDI and audio files look different. So what I had to do to sync the MIDI audio was bring in the exported audio clips that I already used for Premiere and then synced those two things up. And then after that, I synced it to the draft audio I exported from Premiere. It's a very overly complicated process, so if you're confused, don't worry about it. That's why I think it would just be way easier to start off by combining the MIDI in the first place. So if that's what you wanna do, here's how I did it. So after I sequenced the MIDI audio correctly, I joined them and then cleaned up the transitions by adjusting the sustain pedal. This is not something that I knew beforehand, so I had to look it up, and you just gotta click here to reveal it, and then drag the dots up and down to adjust the sustain pedal strength. For some reason, my March section had the sustain pedal the entire time at 20, which made no sense because I didn't even use it, but maybe the grass got to it. Either way, after fixing up the sustain pedal, I made some minor adjustments in Logic. Sometimes a note I played would be super soft, even though I played it in the same way I would on a real piano, so I just increased the velocity slightly. I did this for maybe six notes total, otherwise it would have taken forever. I also cleaned up about three notes of mistakes that happened in the EDM Improv 2. While hitting those octaves, it seems my pinky finger on my right hand sometimes hit a note next to it. It was super silent, but I just wanted to clean it up anyways. Other than that, I didn't do anything else to the audio and used my CFX Concert Grand plugin for the piano sound and exported it. To close off this tutorial, my final decision was whether or not I wanted to export in 4K or 1080. Since I did zoom in quite a lot at some points, the image quality wouldn't be as great, but if I had a 1080 timeline, since 4K is double that, it wouldn't have lost any quality if you zoom in up to two times. I figured that I'd just stick with 4K and watch it and see if I notice any bad image quality, and luckily I didn't, so I just kept it in 4K. And that's also somewhat of a lie since at first viewing, it actually looked terrible. Everything kind of looked terrible. That's because I accidentally left the proxies on for After Effects. Apparently, if you dynamic link, the whole rule about always exporting with the original footage goes out the window. You have to toggle the proxies in After Effects project window on and off at the right times. On when you're editing and then off right before you export in Premiere. I was super happy that it looked good after that because I was totally freaking out beforehand. After all of that was done, I felt pretty darn satisfied with the end result. There are some quirks to the video, some things I could have definitely played better, some visuals that could have been better as well, like, you know, keeping this seaweed box out of the shot. But in the end, it felt like it paid off and I felt a lot lighter. Like I finally made it to the end of a journey that I've been trying to finish for a while. It's a good feeling. So as my final tips for you guys who want to try something like this, 
Number one, the fewer the locations, the easier. The more controlled your location, the easier. Obvious, but just something to note. You can also just change your surroundings in different ways to try and make a different vibe. That's probably what I'll try next. Number two, gimbal shots are better overall. Learning from my experience, if the gimbal happened to jolt the camera, you should just do a retake. The gimbal operator needs to have really good communication skills for that. Static shots are just not as good, but if you have a variety, you can definitely make something work well. I'd say in my final video, it ended up being 60% gimbal and 40% static shots, um, although that is just a guess. Number three, have your piece prepared. Like rock solid, I can play this in my sleep prepared. Because when you're outside or performing for a camera, it's definitely a different feeling. Also, perfect takes every time can help reduce editing by a lot. It can probably cut the time in half or even more. It'll save you storage space too. So, lots of various tips that came about from this project. I really hope you guys can take some of them and apply them to your future projects. If I didn't cover something you want to learn more about, just let me know in the comments and I'll try my best to answer. Don't forget, if you want to check out the sheet music, you can find it down below. I just ask that you go ahead and give this video a like and subscribe if you haven't already. It'd also be amazing if you shared my Flower Downs 5 Styles video and subscribe to that channel as well. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you guys in the next project.